There is absolutely no greater study or endeavor that one could partake in than to know Jesus Christ. Of all figures in history, Jesus stands well above the most notable and rightfully so. No single person has more influenced or shaped the world than Jesus. This unique situation is not because Jesus was merely a great man. It is true because Jesus is the Son of God. Many men have left their mark on history, but ancient history looked forward to the coming of Jesus. Prophecies foretold of him, ancient types and figures foreshadowed him, and the people of God longed for and waited for him. And when he came, when he left heaven to dwell among men, he did not disappoint. He wasn't exactly what the Jews were expecting, but he was so much more. He left an unforgettable stamp on human history that will never be forgotten. He has changed the world more than any single human being, even though his kingdom wasn't and isn't even of this world. While his life had historic significance, it had much more spiritual significance. It was, after all, his coming, his living, his dying, and his rising that undid the terrible consequences of Adam and Eve's rebellion in the Garden of Eden millennia ago. How zealously we should pursue the advice of Peter, whose final words of his New Testament letter simply say, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. And thus we embark on a great and awesome journey, a study of the life of our Lord. It must be recognized at the outset of such a study, though, no amount of words we speak or share will fully do justice to the magnificence of our Lord. Charles Spurgeon once said, I know my words cannot honor him according to his merits. I wish they could. I am quite sure to fail when telling of his excellence. Indeed, I grow less and less satisfied with my thoughts and language concerning him. He is too glorious for my feeble language to describe him. If I could speak with the tongues of men and of angels, I could not speak worthily of him. If I could borrow all the harmonies of heaven, the music would still not be sweet enough for his praises. This study, however detailed it becomes, could never be exhaustive. But then again, even the Gospels themselves are not fully exhaustive. John said at the end of his book, in John 21 and verse 25, And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which, if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. One of my favorite verses of a song that we sometimes sing is the third verse of F. H. Lehman's The Love of God. It says there, Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stock on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forever more endure the saints and angel song. As John wrote in his first epistle, it is in Jesus that God's love was truly manifested toward us. In First John 4 verse 9 he says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. While not everything Christ did was written or could be written, we have been given more than enough to come to a knowledge of Christ and even to grow in the grace of knowing him. John also said in John 20 in verse 30 and 31, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And so we begin this study today, seeking to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus, so that we might know him better, so that we might follow him closer, and so that we may preach him to others more fully, all for his glory and his honor. There are many ways that we could go about the study of our Lord's life. We could go a gospel at a time, we could focus on specifics such as his miracles or his teachings, or we could try to harmonize all of the records together for a full look at Jesus' life. I have chosen to opt for the third option. My goal is to work through from the very beginning, like really before the beginning, of Christ's earthly life all the way through his death and resurrection, harmonizing the four gospel accounts to give us one complete view, as was the intent of the gospel writers, of Christ's life and work. I will not be able to cover every detail and event as thoroughly as I or you might like, but I will do my best to give adequate time to each story that we come across. Special attention will be given to Christ's miracles, his teachings such as sermons or parables, his conversations, and of course, his attributes. 
Since I won't be able to fully cover everything from the pulpit, though, much of your growth through this study is going to be in your own hands. It will be up to you to take the things taught here home with you to study them out further and truly delve into the wonders of Christ's life. If you will do that, though, your work and effort will be greatly rewarded. At the onset of a study like this, it is helpful to review the books which contain the narrative of Jesus' life. The first four books of the New Testament that we call the Gospels. The Gospel accounts, of course, are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, as one approaches the Gospels, there may be a number of questions. Why are there four? Who wrote them? How did they get the information they wrote about? What about supposed differences and contradictions? And perhaps most importantly of all, are they reliable? First of all, it is important that we understand the gospel narratives are testimonies in a sense. They are witness accounts of what he did and what that means to all people. They are four accounts of the same person, Jesus, as told by four different men. This helps us answer not only what they are, but also the question, what about some of the differences? Think for a moment about a court case. Imagine a judge calls four separate witnesses to a stand to testify about what they observed. If one witness after another repeat verbatim the testimony of the others, the judge will recognize immediately their testimony is a fabrication. When four people talk about the same event, you get four unique perspectives, four unique points of view. Details that one individual tells about at length might go completely untold by another. That doesn't mean their testimony doesn't agree. It means that all their testimony together provides a fuller picture. That's exactly what we have with the Gospels. We have four accounts given about the life of Jesus. There are differences because they are told by four unique witnesses. The clear truth, though, is they tell the same story, the story of Christ. The fact that there are four witness accounts adds importance and confidence to the story. Throughout the Bible, the principle of having two or three witnesses is well established. If the testimony of two or three is satisfactory, how much more is the testimony of four? Now, skeptics try to claim that the differences are contradictions, but the honest Bible student will see them for what they truly are, supplementary details that help us see the fuller picture of Christ's life. As we go through our study and encounter some of these differences and supposed contradictions, we will take time to address them and learn the truth of them together. Another, another thing that helps us understand the Gospels is to understand the purpose of each. While the central purpose of all the Gospels is the story of Christ, the books were originally written at different times to different people for different reasons. The first three Gospels Matthew, Mark, and Luke are often called the Synoptic Gospels because the events they cover are very similar. John's Gospel is quite different in material, as we will see, but of course is still telling the story of Jesus. The first book of the New Testament is the Gospel according to Matthew. Matthew was one of the twelve disciples. He was a former tax collector, as we read in Matthew 9 and verse 9. And as a disciple, he was an actual eyewitness and later an apostle in the church. Most commentators believe Matthew's gospel was originally written to a Jewish audience, that is, a Christian audience with a Jewish background. Matthew quotes frequently from the Old Testament and frequently uses terms that are familiar to a Jewish audience. Matthew focuses a great deal on the words and teachings of Jesus, emphasizing his authority and that Jesus was the Messiah the Jews were looking for. The second gospel that we have is the gospel according to Mark. Now you might ask yourself, who is Mark? After all, when you look through the gospel accounts and you read the lists of disciples, you find Matthew, but you don't find Mark listed because Mark wasn't one of the twelve disciples. Mark was a young evangelist, though, during the first century. He was the son of a woman named Mary, who was an early Christian in Jerusalem, according to Acts 12 and verse 12. He was the cousin of Barnabas, according to Colossians 4 and verse 10, and he accompanied Paul and Barnabas through some of their first missionary journey. He is mentioned twice as being with Paul, and Paul requested Mark's presence at the end of 2 Timothy. Mark was also with Peter when Peter wrote his first epistle, and Peter even refers to Mark as his son in 1 Peter 5 and verse 13, similar to how Paul frequently called Timothy his son in the faith. Some think that Mark is the unnamed young man in Mark 14 and verse 51 that followed Jesus at a distance after his arrest in Gethsemane. That seems possible since Mark is the only gospel that includes that detail. 
If that is true, then Mark was at least around and close with Jesus and the disciples, apparently, even at a very young age, and would have seen some of Jesus' ministry with his own eyes. He was clearly close with Peter, and some of the second century church writers claim that Mark wrote his gospel based upon Peter's testimony. This seems like a very plausible explanation, and between Peter's eyewitness testimony and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and possibly even Mark's eyewitness testimony, Mark provides the second gospel in the New Testament. Now, Mark's gospel is very similar, yet also very different from Matthew's. Mark is typically a much more abbreviated book, but he does spend more time on the miracles of Jesus than does Matthew or Luke. Many believe that Mark's original audience was more of a Gentile background, some even believing it was written to Christians in Rome. He has no genealogy. He offers explanations of Jewish customs, which would be unnecessary to a Jewish audience, and he doesn't quote from the Old Testament very frequently at all. Mark focuses substantially on what Jesus did. He emphasizes Jesus' miracles and his care and compassion as he served others. The third gospel that we have is, of course, the gospel according to Luke. Luke was another first century evangelist that we find frequently with the Apostle Paul during his travels in Acts. Luke was likely a Greek, but clearly an early convert. Luke was a physician, according to Colossians 4 and verse 14, and from his writings we see him as a meticulous historian. Luke prefaces his work as an orderly account obtained directly from eyewitnesses to the life of Jesus. While Luke didn't see the specific events himself, it seems he spent great time speaking with those that did. Guided in this effort by the Holy Spirit, Luke wrote the third gospel, and he also later wrote the book of Acts. Luke's gospel also seems to be written to a non-Jewish audience originally, and many believe it was written primarily to a Greek audience, because it does have a certain appeal to the student, as his narrative lays out an orderly and well-thought-out account. Luke is the longest and most extensive of the Gospels, and there are several pieces of his Gospel not found in the others, such as the stories of the prodigal son and the Good Samaritan, the birth narratives of Jesus, and some others. In many ways, Luke portrays Jesus as the perfect man. And then finally, we have the fourth Gospel, the Gospel according to John. Now, John, of course, was one of the twelve disciples and one of the apostles, and John was a very close friend with Jesus. It was John, his brother James, and Peter that make up what we often call the inner circle of Jesus' friends. John refers to himself even in his narrative as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now John's Gospel seems very different than the Synoptic Gospels. It starts differently, it flows differently, it leaves out many of the stories found in the other books, and it includes many details not found in the other Gospels. Why so? Well, most commentators agree that the Synoptic Gospels were probably all written before A.D. 70, before the destruction of Jerusalem. John's Gospel was probably written closer to the end of the first century. As is evident in the New Testament, even towards the close of the first century, erroneous and false teachings about Jesus had begun to pop up. Thus, John's Gospel is directed at all believers and presents Jesus from beginning to end as deity, emphasizing Jesus as the Son of God. Going from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you will find some difference in the geographical names. This is because when we come to the New Testament, much has changed, and Israel was now under Roman rule. Rome frequently broke up territories into provinces and placed kings and governors or other rulers over those various provinces. The area of the world known as Israel, sometimes referred to as Canaan in the Old Testament, was known as Palestine in the first century. Palestine was divided up into several sections by the Romans, but there were three primary areas, especially regarding uh, the Lord's ministry and his life. Those areas were Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. Judea was in the south, the province where Jerusalem was located, and much of Jesus' time, of course, was spent in Jerusalem. We have many stories of Jesus in Jerusalem and the area of Judea. Of course, he was born in Bethlehem which was in Judea. Samaria was just north, and this is, of course, where the despised Samaritans lived. One thing interesting is many Jews, if they were traveling from Judea to Galilee or vice versa, instead of passing through Samaria, they would actually cross over the Jordan River to some of the territories east of there and travel north or south until they got to their destination and then cross back over the Jordan River 
all so that they could avoid traveling through Samaria and possibly encountering some of the despised Samaritans. Jesus didn't do this. We have multiple stories of Jesus as he traveled between Galilee and Judea going through Samaria. This is why we have the story in John 4 of Jesus speaking with the woman at the well. She was a Samaritan. Jesus didn't subscribe to the racial hatred of some of the people around him, and he was perfectly fine traveling through Samaria and spreading the gospel there as well. And of course, north of Samaria was Galilee in northern Palestine. Galilee is where Jesus grew up in the city of Nazareth and spent much of his ministry. In fact, Capernaum, up on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee, was really Jesus' base of operations. It was his hometown throughout most of his ministry. And so much of what we find in the Gospels takes place up in this northern province of Galilee. When studying any subject, understanding the context and background is always important. And that is also true when we approach a study of the Gospels. When you turn the page from the end of Malachi's prophecy to the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, you are passing over four centuries of monumental historic events. As a result of four centuries and drastically different times, the New Testament immediately feels different than the Old. As we've already mentioned in regards to geography, names of places are already a little different in some cases. Further, you read of Pharisees and Sadducees that aren't found anywhere in the Old Testament. You read of synagogues and the Sanhedrin that likewise aren't mentioned in the Old Testament. And so there are several new developments in the New Testament, and that's a result of the history that had taken place. So a brief review of the history that took place in the intertestamental period helps us understand the context of Jesus' life and therefore garner a greater appreciation for his life and work. Additionally, seeing the unfolding of history up to the point of Christ gives us a very strong reminder that God has always been, and of course still is, in control. After returning to Canaan from Egypt, Israel was one nation. Before long, however, they demanded a king, and under Saul, David, and Solomon, Israel was one nation. But during the reign of Rehoboam, the ten northern tribes rebelled and became the northern kingdom of Israel, while Judah and Benjamin became the southern kingdom of Judah. After years of evil and idolatry, Israel was taken captive by Assyria as punishment for her sins, and a little over a century later, Judah was taken in captivity to Babylon, who had since risen as the world power. It was during the time of exile that Daniel the prophet lived. Now, Daniel chapter 2 tells of a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and the interpretation that Daniel provided. In this dream, Nebuchadnezzar had seen a great image, a great statue of a man. The head was made of gold, the chest and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of bronze, and the legs of iron, and the feet were iron mixed with clay. Further, he saw a great stone cut out without hands, and the stone struck the image on the feet, crushing the statue. According to Daniel's interpretation, God had actually revealed world history to Nebuchadnezzar. The gold head was Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom of Babylon. The arms and the chest of silver represented the Medo-Persian Empire. This kingdom did conquer Babylon even during the lifetime of Daniel. And it was under that kingdom that the Jews returned to Jerusalem, the temple was rebuilt, and it was the reigning kingdom when the book of Malachi ends. Like Babylon, however, the Persian kingdom would come to an end and be replaced by the kingdom of Greece, represented by the belly and thighs of bronze. Greece would also ultimately fall to the kingdom represented by the legs of iron and the feet of clay mixed with iron, which we understand to be the Roman Empire. Daniel foretold that during the days of that kingdom, God would establish an eternal kingdom. And just as Daniel foretold it, world history played out. Further, the events that happened shaped the world to be what it was when Jesus came, the perfect time for the Savior. The Medo-Persian kingdom had conquered Babylon, and later, under Alexander the Great, Greece defeated Persia. And in a few short years, Alexander literally had conquered the world. Now, Alexander sought to make every man a Greek, and spread Greek influence across the world. As a result, Greek became the universal language of the civilized world, and it was even during the time of Christ. Lest we think that's just a small detail of history, remember that the New Testament was written in Greek, which, as one writer described it, 
was the most flexible, accurate, and beautiful language ever known to man. Also under Alexander, many Jews dispersed to other parts of the world. This had already happened to some measure during the exile years, and it would continue further in the Roman Empire, but the dispersion of the Jewish people around the world explains why, on Pentecost of Acts chapter 2, there were present devout Jews from every nation under heaven, which we're told in Acts chapter 2 and verse 5. Well, the Greece empire didn't last forever, of course. As we've already seen, they would be supplanted by the legs of iron and the feet of iron mixed with clay, which was Rome. So Rome became the next empire and grew to a great and enormous kingdom, a kingdom of great power. Now, two notable things about Rome is, one, they allowed conquered people to largely retain their culture and religions. Thus, even though Israel was under Roman rule at the time of Christ, Judaism was allowed to flourish so long as the Jews paid their taxes and didn't seek revolution against Rome. Also, Rome built roads and highways across the world, enabling them to move their armies and facilitate trade. These roads and the routes made world travel more possible than ever before. So by the time of Christ, we have a universal language developed that's worthy of being used to write the New Testament. We have Jewish people that have dispersed throughout the world, and travel was more possible than ever. What that means is the gospel could be preached far and wide very quickly in the first century, which is exactly what happened. And so we see God orchestrating the events just as he needed, just as he had foretold, so that the fullness of time could come for his son to be born and for the process of redemption, the plan of redemption, to begin to come to fruition. Now, even more important to our understanding of the times of Jesus than the historical setting are the religious changes that had taken place in Israel. We find several things in the New Testament that are a little different or have changed a little bit from the Old Testament. The temple is the same temple that had been rebuilt during the return from captivity. However, throughout history, throughout the last several hundred years, the temple had been desecrated, especially by Antiochus Epiphanes. But about 16 years before Jesus was born, Herod the Great had begun reconstructing the temple. It was likely even still under construction or portion of construction during the life of Jesus. But we find some other things here in the, in the New Testament. We find the Sanhedrin. This was a group of 70 leaders plus the chief priest. This kind of supreme court of the Jewish nation had arisen around 200 B.C. and was the, were the rulers of the Jewish people. We also see synagogues. Now, if you look through the Old Testament, you don't find a synagogue mentioned, and yet you find them continually throughout the New. Well, with the exile to Babylon, the Jews saw a need to continue teaching the law while they, went, while they were away from Jerusalem. And seemingly, during this period, the synagogue was formed. A synagogue could be formed with as little as ten Jewish men, and they typically served as a schoolhouse through the week and were used as a gathering house on the Sabbath for Jews to come together to pray and to sing and to hear the law read and taught. As the Jews dispersed throughout the world, they set up synagogues everywhere they went. Larger towns might even have several synagogues. In Jesus' life, we find him from time to time in a synagogue, even reading and teaching in the synagogues. So that's where they have come from. But during the intertestamental period, we also have various groups or sects that had arisen amongst the Jews. From history, we see five distinct groups. Four are mentioned in the New Testament, and two are very prominent. First of all, there were the Pharisees. The Pharisees were separatists that seemingly rose to combat Greek influence that many Jews were giving into. They were more of a religious party than a political party, but they held great power over the people. The Pharisees created many traditions to help protect the law, and while their intentions may have been pure at first, they degenerated into a group of formalists that considered their traditions as binding as God's law. Jesus flatly rejected their traditions and had harsh rebukes for them on many occasions. Because Jesus defied their traditions, they were bitter enemies with Jesus, and we'll, as we'll see through our studies. Another group we find frequently in the New Testament are the Sadducees. They were the wealthy, aristocratic party. 
They were commonly priests, although not all of the priests were Sadducees. They were more accepting of Greek ways, or really whatever ways were of the ruling power, and they were the liberal party of the day. Really, they were more of a political party than a religious sect. Many scholars believe the Sadducees only viewed the books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy, as scripture, and even then they didn't use it very well. The Sadducees denied the existence of angels, and particularly they denied the resurrection and the afterlife, which was the source of contention with the Pharisees and the central point of one particular encounter with Jesus. They, like the Pharisees, hated Jesus, but more likely because he threatened their power and rule. They didn't want anyone upsetting the Roman authorities and risking the wrath of Caesar, so any talk of a Messiah was very troubling to them. A third group that we learn of through history is a group called the Essenes. These were a somewhat odd group. Uh, they were located down by the Dead Sea, and uh, they don't have any encounters in the New Testament that we read of. We never find them mentioned in the Gospels. Now, some people have tried to argue that John the Baptist was an Essene, or even that the church was heavily influenced by the Essenes, but there is absolutely no evidence to support either of those views. The fourth group that we have is the Herodians. The Herodians were a party of Jews dedicated to the Herods, who were the rulers of various parts of Palestine. Clearly, they were much more of a political party. Very little is said in the New Testament about them, but we do read on a couple of occasions that the Pharisees worked with the Herodians to try and defeat Jesus. And then the last party that we can talk about are the Zealots. The Zealots were a violent group dedicated to the overthrow of Rome. Apparently their motto was, no tribute to Caesar, no king but Jehovah, no tax but the temple tax. We are told that the disciple Simon was apparently a zealot in Luke 6 verse 15 as well as Acts 1 and verse 13. But other than Simon, the zealots are not mentioned in the New Testament. But some commentators have remarked they may have played a more significant role during the life of Christ uh, than we sometimes might realize. Given their violent nature, the zealots were ready to rebel against Rome at any time, and a misconception about the Messiah could lead to dire consequences. On many occasions, Jesus sternly warned some that had been healed to not spread the story around. While this puzzles us sometimes, perhaps one of the reasons was to keep the zealots from being overly excited and try and revolt. In John chapter 6, after feeding the 5,000, we're told that the crowd was about to take Jesus by force and make him their king. It's hard to not see the zealots at work there. It's also very possible that the zealots are who Jesus spoke of in Matthew 11 and verse 12 when he said, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Many question what that verse is referring to. It's very possible that he's speaking of the zealots at this time. And it is possible that even the thieves on the cross were zealots. We're told that Barabbas was a notorious criminal and that he had committed murder in a rebellion. It's almost certain that the two thieves that were crucified with Jesus were co-conspirators with Barabbas. If these men were types to use violence and even commit murder in rebellion, it seems to make sense that they were very possibly zealots themselves. And so, while not called by name, this group might be there more often than we realize throughout the pages of the Gospel accounts. Well, as we look at this religious context, as we look at the historical background and the religious setting, in some ways, the setting is very, very bleak. After all, the Jewish nation is occupied by Rome. They are ruled by the Herods, which were frequently a cruel and evil lot. And there hadn't been a king from the lineage of David sitting on the throne since they had been captured by Babylon centuries ago. Religiously, things couldn't have been worse. Between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and other religious factions, the multitudes were overburdened and wearied. Undoubtedly, this religious and political climate is what Isaiah referred to in Isaiah 53 and verse 2, speaking of Jesus as a tender plant in dry ground. As in some ways, it seems like the absolute worst of times for the Messiah. And yet, in other ways, it was the best of times. You see, as you turn your pages from Malachi to Matthew, you step over 400 years of history and turmoil, and you step into what Paul called the fullness of time. In Galatians 4, verse 4 and 5, Paul said, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, 
born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. Yes, despite the political oppression and the religious division, for the pious, God-fearing Jew, anticipation couldn't have been higher for the Messiah. And in that backdrop, in that setting, Jesus came from heaven. He stepped out of the glorious throne room with the Father above, and he stepped squarely into human history. He didn't step down in a show of power and force. He would come in the most modest of ways, born in a manger, living the life of a carpenter in Nazareth. And while unassuming as his beginning was, he would change the world forever. He would preach a new message with authority like never heard before. He would prove his authority with miracles that were unimaginable. He would triumph over every foe that sought to defeat him. And in the one moment that seemed like defeat, he defeated Satan himself and the power of the grave. He would lay down his life as a sacrifice and then do what no man had ever done. He would rise from the dead never again to see corruption. And in his coming, in his living, in his dying and in his rising, he established an eternal kingdom, just as foretold by Daniel, by the way, a kingdom not just for the Jews, but for all men that would believe on him and obey him. And through his kingdom, he would offer pardon and redemption and peace and life everlasting. So again I say, there is no greater endeavor than to learn about and come to know Jesus Christ. And thus, we end our introduction and prepare to delve into the beautiful and wonderful story of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ so that we can grow in our knowledge of Him, so that we can grow in our ability to be like Him, and so that we can grow in our capability to teach Him and preach Him and His will to others. All for the glory and the honor of our wonderful...